And so it's taken a lot of years, I think, for the industry to figure out how to start to connect those dots in, in the data space. But I think we're seeing a pretty decent upward trend in, in effectively doing so. Without supplies, there's no surgery. Without products, there's no patient care. Welcome to Power Supply, the healthcare supply chain podcast focused on helping you navigate the intricacies of logistics, purchasing, contracting, and supplier relationships. Each episode, we speak with healthcare executives, supply chain leaders, and innovative entrepreneurs from across the country as they share their stories, experience, and expertise on the industry we love. From the loading dock to strategic sourcing, from buyers to the C-suite and across the enterprise, we tackle the real-life issues impacting the healthcare supply chain. Whether you're tuning in for conversation or inspiration, we're glad you're here. You're just in time to hear it from the source and stock up on insight. So sit back and plug into Power Supply. This week on Power Supply, we speak with Jeffrey Stevens, president of Estovo Enterprises. Jeff has spent over 25 years in healthcare with clinical, operational, supply chain, and executive leadership experience. He's worked for four of the largest GPOs in the U.S. and ran supply chain operations for some of the largest for-profit and not-for-profit health systems in the United States. The largest scope for executive level supply chain leadership that Jeff was involved in included three distribution centers serving 21 hospitals across five states with nearly $1 billion in supply spend annually. So, Gary, I realize that you know, Jeff, you've done a good job of bringing in some good guests early on, some nice invites. And I'm excited to talk to Jeff today about maximizing GPO relationships, which really has, this landscape has changed immensely over the last decade, kind of coinciding a lot with the changes in healthcare reimbursement and the Accountable Care Act. And so putting all these pieces together and talking about how vendors and how GPOs and how hospital systems and IDNs have adjusted to that is going to be a real focus of today's conversation. Justin, I think you're right on. Jeff being from the executive level presence that he's been at over multiple years, you talked about it, $1 billion in supply costs. You, you really, really, really lean on the GPOs. I mean, he's really been an, an advocate of the GPOs and really bringing them in as part of the business partnership that they truly should have. And I think how the GPOs have transpired, Jeff will be able to share a lot of his expertise on how it fills in with all levels from the clinical side, the value analysis side we talked about, and uh, just understanding how the GPOs are, are part of the true business plan. We Again, we talk about from, you call it soup to nuts, Justin, from the beginning of supply chain all the way to rev cycle. He's going to close that gap and talk about how GPOs are really a big part of that partnership with our hospital systems, and his experience will be worthwhile to hear today. All right, we're looking forward to it. We're going to be right back after a short break with Jeff Stevens, president of Estovo Enterprises. From 17 Studios, you're listening to Power Supply. Joining us now is Jeffrey Stevens, president of Estovo Enterprises. Jeff, we're really excited to have you on the show today to talk about maximizing GPO relationships. So thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Why don't you start by giving us a little bit of your your background? I mean, we read a brief bio when we kick this thing off, but why don't you tell us how you got passionate about it. And and maybe the industry just kind of carried you away. Take us down that road of, of how you came to where you are. Sure. So uh, I actually got my start in healthcare around 95 when I enlisted in the Navy as a medic or a corpsman, as we call it in the Navy. I spent a number of years in clinical capacities and then biomedical engineering or medical repair. And then got out of the Navy and started my career path for building a civilian career. And I really kind of happened into supply chain over the course of time. 
when I moved over from a civilian clinical engineering firm to what used to be Broadlane as a GPO and started out in a technical capacity that really wasn't supply chain specific so much as it was utilizing my experience in clinical engineering, but really just kind of had some great opportunities that slowly but surely brought me more squarely into the supply chain realm. Have had a great opportunity over the course of time to work for multiple GPOs, some of the largest healthcare systems, for-profit and not-for-profit in the U.S., running supply chain operations to include distribution. So you've seen a lot of changes, just in, in maybe even only in recent years, but there's been a lot of consolidation amongst the group purchasing organizations. There's been a shift in strategy and focus as a result of the consolidation on the other side, which is healthcare hospitals becoming larger systems and IDNs. What are some of the things that really stand out to you over maybe the last 10 to 20 years as this is the way it was and this is what it's become today? Well, to your point about consolidation, there certainly 10, 15 years ago was several more national GPOs than there are today. It's interesting because what I've experienced on one hand is through that consolidation, some shift in breadth and depth of GPOs and and how GPOs are used. There's a lot of, from one GPO to the next, you've got a fair amount of variance as to exclusivity and thus the strategy that's deployed by an IDN in their relationship with a GPO. So in the consolidation, for instance, you may have had a relationship with a GPO that required exclusivity, and thus you had a very deep use of the contract portfolio. But then another GPO would acquire said GPO, and you really couldn't get the participants to function with the GPO in the same manner, and they wanted more flexibility. They wanted to cherry pick a little bit more. And so GPOs may have acquired other GPOs for the purposes of bringing better contract discipline, but then that kind of fell apart because the cultures didn't mesh very well. So that's one of the one of the significant things that I've seen as that consolidation has occurred. So it's changed some of the space a little bit. Appreciate yeah. your comments there and on, on things how they've moved along the last decade and things of how they've changed. One of the specific questions that I think about when we access a GPO and I really want to get your experience here is the time. It seems that you you get multiple healthcare systems, as Justin talked about, that move into the larger systems and you acquire, say, a, a 10, a 15 hospital healthcare system from ASCs to critical access to larger level one, level two, level three. But the negotiation seems to save a lot of time. Can you talk about just like the M&A with those hospital systems and how they move into that GPO, the labor time, the negotiation strategies, how that changes? Can you speak to that a little bit? So, Gary, just just to clarify your question. So as those IDN mergers and acquisitions occur, are are we talking about, in effect, the the value of leveraging those negotiations and that volume together and the efficiency that comes from that? Absolutely, please. Yeah, so, you know, clearly the more volume you put together, right, the better leverage you've got on the marketplace. And yes, I mean, that that is the essence in effect of a GPO or the the intent of a GPO. And so absolutely, as, as IDNs merge and you're leveraging that together, Not only are you creating better buying power, but you're also creating an efficiency in the staff that it takes to contract in effect, right? So through consolidation, your back office contracting functions can also find some efficiency and you can reduce some labor costs associated with that by properly leveraging the relationship with your GPO. You know, it's interesting. You were just talking about from the healthcare standpoint, how they adjusted and what they were able to gain. But how did the vendors 
and the vendors who have the relationships with the GPOs adjust. And I'm going to follow with that on how the GPOs adjusted as well and talk about things like big data with those big aggregate data sets that has kind of changed the types of value that they offer. But let's start with the vendors. What? How did you see the vendors responding to all of that? Well, in a lot of ways, there was a significant pushback in the vendor space as you had major volume more effectively being leveraged as the IDNs consolidated as well as the GPOs. And and so you kind of keep shrinking the pool and creating better leverage. But from the vendor's perspective, that meant less and less opportunity to maintain their margins. As the GPOs leverage more volume on them, of course, they're driving the cost down further. The capital space comes to mind as we're having this conversation. And and now you're leveraging the volume of 20, 30 major health systems to drive down capital acquisition costs as well as related service costs. And, And certainly my experience was the major equipment manufacturers were not happy about it and certainly tried to push back as long as they could. But in effect, they finally had to play ball because there's too much volume at stake at some point for them. Jeff, I'd ask you, as we've talked about consolidation of GPOs, in the last 10 years, there's been several consolidations. Now we're essentially down to three, right? Premier, Vizient, and HPG, a health trust. Do the hospitals win on that or do the suppliers win on that? Who who actually benefits from the consolidation of all three of those? Wow. That is a great question, Hayes. I like to believe that that the customer does, right? The the participant in the GPO. But I think there's several factors at play when you ask that question. If I go about the question a little bit different way and think about how does it affect the vendor space, I think that on one front, it's positive for the vendors because it's it's less national accounts to manage and they can maybe try to align a little bit more effectively from a long-term strategic perspective with the GPOs. That being said, if we go back to the last question, I, I still think there's a negative impact to some degree there in that you get down to three and if the GPOs are doing their jobs very well, they're bringing to bear some pretty significant volume, thus leverage to drive cost, ultimately price point down on those vendors. From a GPO perspective, I think by and large, it, it's it's positive for the GPO. And then ultimately, again, I, I like to believe it has a positive impact on the participant. Mm-hmm. You know, I think some of the adjustments there, you mentioned the adjustment in the value, but really that purchasing power was really on a line item, right? It was just squeezing line item savings because of the aggregate volume and squeezing the line item savings. And so from the vendor's perspective, what I've heard them say is there's no more to squeeze. You got us, you know, you got us as far as we can go. And then what I've kind of seen GPOs do is, is two things that stick out in my mind. I'm sure there's many others. But I see them looking at more like helping them take that value-based approach so that they can actually weigh out not just savings, but efficiencies, reducing readmissions, because obviously healthcare reimbursements changed in the last decade. And so they're trying to collect that kind of data. And another place that I've seen GPOs move into that they really hadn't previously was purchase services because purchase services was, boy, you want to talk about a difficult RFP to go through. That's that's what they gave the rookie <laughs> in supply chain to do. They were like, <laughs> why don't you go out and uh, see if you can't find us a better deal on a service contract? And standardizing that pricing was always so difficult. Nobody really wanted it. But that's been the Wild West 
in the group purchasing world. And now all of a sudden, there's a major move into that space. So the opportunities there, it's just, is the market there is what I've always kind of seen. How do you how do you view that? Do you view it a little bit differently? Or do you think of some other areas where you've seen GPOs adjust to meet needs and, and be a little more strategic versus just line item aggregate volume savings? No, Justin, I, I think you're spot on. I, I think that all the GPOs find themselves really looking for a tweak to their value proposition because uh, I, I do think the market has effectively driven costs down on commodities as well as capital for that matter. And so I think you're absolutely correct in everything that you just said. When I think about data and purchase services, one, absolutely, I mean, Premier has been a long time proponent of doing a better job of using their participants' data to help them in their operations, not just in driving costs down at the price at the pump, if you will. I think back to the broad lane days and there was a big push in their tenure prior to being acquired by Meta Assets to really get into the bigger data space. It, it's been a slow progression on the, on the big data side, but I think you're starting to see a much greater effect finally. Part of the challenge, in my opinion, has been data within the healthcare space is just extremely disparate. You've got clinical data that is very hard to correlate to financial data oftentimes, not to mention the challenges around around billing and, and billing coming from multiple sources for one episode. And, and so it's taken a lot of years, I think, for the industry to figure out how to start to connect those dots in, in the data space. But I think we're seeing a pretty decent upward trend in, in effectively doing so. On the purchase services front, again, I think back to the broad lane days, and they were one that was progressive in trying to do things like national biomed or clinical engineering contracts. It is a very difficult space, Justin, when you get into purchase services, but I agree with you that those two areas are really where everyone has started to turn in the GPO space in order to drive additional value because we've kind of tapped things out in commodities and capital. Hey, Jeff, you're talking about big data and the data analytics and, and really I think about boots on the ground and with your experience being at the, the C-suite level, the executive level across multiple regions, how do you create the value of the GPO? Obviously, there's the, the quantitative, the dollars that come in. There's admin fees. There's certain price points you're sharing. But how do you continue to build that value within the clinical side, the value analysis side, the, the CNO, the CEO, the COO, I guess all the people at the table? How do you continually build that so everyone is aware of this is why we are with a Premier, an HPG, or a Vizient? How do you continually build that value and, and, and demonstrate its effectiveness? Yeah, I think there's two key parts, Gary. I think that first of all, as a supply chain leader within an IDN, you've got to first of all, really fully integrate into your GPO relationship. It really goes hand in hand with the conversation we just had about what's the greater value prop. And it really comes down to getting very ingrained with your GPO to the degree that you're cross-pollinating your IDN value analysis folks with the GPO's value analysis folks. Furthermore, that you're cross-pollinating your supply chain leaders into the key decision-making boards if they have them for contracting, getting a seat at the table, if you will, to influence the contracting outcomes within that, that GPO. And then lastly, on that front, I think it's just really getting to know the key stakeholders on the GPO side that are the, the folks that really can move the needle for you in maximizing your participation with the GPO, but also finding those additional opportunities to drive value and to leverage the work they're already doing in data analytics and, and clinical data and so forth. Back to the IDN, if you will, as a supply chain leader, I think what's most important is that you really have an executive presence within your own IDN's executive team and are well regarded and integrated with 
to your point, the folks such as the CNO, so that you really are providing a service to your IDN that goes beyond delivering those commodity products to their their med storage spaces that they're operating in, really getting integrated with the clinical leaders to understand the challenges and finding those opportunities to drive additional value, again, beyond just price at the pump and, and making sure they have what they need when they need it. Jeff, I have a question for you as it relates to this point right here about bringing value to the hospital systems. What, what's your take, and the pandemic has caused this, but what's your take on these GPOs beginning to actually invest in, purchase their own manufacturing, and actually are bringing products to to the field, if you will. What do you think is going to happen on that? Is it going to be effective? And what are your thoughts around that? So, Hayes, the, the GPOs, many of them have been doing some sort of this for several years, actually. Lower scale or smaller scale, I should say. And so it's not exactly new, but to your point, The pandemic has created a a whole new level of demand, and I think it has really taken the GPOs in their efforts to do this to the next level. So I I think that it can be successful. It's interesting to see different GPOs are using a little bit different strategy in doing this. Some are partnering with companies here in the U.S. that have manufacturing capacity which I think is a smart move, just given the over the ocean challenges with moving manufactured goods from Asia. So bottom line is, I think it can be effective. I think inherently, long term, there's going to be some ongoing challenges with it from an FDA perspective. We're having a little easier time to do some of this underneath that authorization act. And some of those abilities will will go away and it will get more challenging to continue. But I I think it can ultimately be successful and and really hopefully drive some expense out of the operating costs of the IDN. One more question for you. And it's, there seems to be a surge for outpatient surgeries going a lot from the hospital setting to the ASC. You're seeing more ortho, you're seeing more spine, obviously some ENT and some other other different surgery capacities. But in your mind, are you seeing that trend and the value of the GPO is really diving into that space as we move forward and get better reimbursements, both on the commercial and, and the Medicare side? Yeah, I think that the GPOs certainly have the ability to provide a fair amount of value there. And I think largely they do. What's interesting within the IDN space and the ASC, the challenge that I really see is that you're moving, you're moving good margin to ASCs and thus away from the hospital setting. And so if you look at a marketplace in which that's happening such that the IDN doesn't own both spaces, it's really putting a margin pressure, a great amount of pressure on the hospital operator's margin. And that is one of the, in my opinion, one of the biggest drivers in the last 10, 15 years on expense management for for the acute care space. A huge problem for our providers right now. You're exactly right. What are some strategies for dealing with that successfully? Before we wrap, I'm just kind of, I'm thinking about that and it's a challenge, but what are some ways that, that that challenge can be overcome at a high level or a granular level, honestly? Well, at a macro level, you know, one of the things that's happening is that the IDNs are trying to acquire those independently on ASCs or orthopedic practices to try to bring that back in to their economic fold, if you will. Beyond that, I think that hospital operators have to really look at, in my opinion, their footprint and decide, should we really operate large hospitals long-term in the way that we have for the last 100 years, or should we really start to change the face of what the delivery model looks like such that as the hospital operator or provider management team 
really diversifies and protects their ability to stay nimble and to focus in on delivering care at the best place, if you will. And really, again, I, I would say take a hard look at what their what their delivery model looks like. You know, this is where all the data, and you, you mentioned this before earlier in the interview, that you felt like that was really starting to come a long way. And I just wonder how much processing power in general, like the technology has been able to enable that, because it, as you mentioned, the data is bad. It doesn't feel like you can fix bad data, or at least in the past, without just an enormous manual effort. And that can be daunting, and the ROI on that isn't always there, especially when you start looking at the macro level like you were just describing. But they are getting a lot better at looking at that data and then comparing providers you know, to Hayes's point and being able to say, here are the outcomes, here are the costs, here are the product. And I feel like they're able to package that up into more of a report card. And so when you talk about for the hospital to try to figure that out, having those advanced analytics is it's got to be pretty critical, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. And then assuming that you're effectively engaged with an entity that can provide you that that type of dashboard data in a in a meaningful way, then the challenge really becomes shifting the culture to allow that data to actually help you make changes. I mean, you, you have to create a culture that allows you to accept that data and change your practices. And that in and of itself is quite the hill to climb. You said something earlier. You said integrated and that whole integrated supply chain. And you you mentioned clinical several times. And I feel like that's kind of how that happened. It started in value analysis. You started seeing nurses participate in value analysis. But now you're seeing physician leadership get very involved. And, and that, to me, is really where that integrated piece comes into play is when the surgeons and and the CMOs are getting involved in those discussions and saying, listen, for the health of the organization, we have to move in this direction. Presenting that information to their colleagues is not the easiest thing to do. And I I know you didn't say it directly, but is that specifically what you what you had in mind? Or you know, when you talk about getting that culture right, is there more to it than that? No, no, you're, you're spot on, Justin. You've really got to get that clinical leadership at the surgeon level and at the respected physician level. And you touched on the CMO. The CMO's role in this is just hypercritical. You really, as a supply chain leader, you really have to partner closely and effectively with the CMO and, for that matter, the CNO. You know, on our last interview, we were talking about something on the other side of that, which was connecting supply chain with RevCycle. But the whole concept was we've got to get it soup to nuts from clinical to RevCycle and get that flowing the right way. And there's some major hurdles there, the clinical piece that we just talked about with you, but then also getting the the, the finances of it right. And you even alluded to it earlier when you were talking about how do we really connect this to the bottom line and to what's happening in billing and how do we make that accurate. So there's a lot of challenges here, but I can tell you, you did you did a nice job of unknowingly piggybacking off of our previous interview and really complimenting it very well and uh, really some great insights here today. Jeff, do you have anything that you might want to add to the conversation before we close? No, I just thank you for that comment, Justin. I, I appreciate knowing that. I'm glad to hear that it, it it was a good segue or a good piggyback, if you will. And I appreciate the opportunity to to talk with you guys. Excellent. Well, we enjoyed having you. Thanks for coming on. That was Jeff Stevens, president of Estovo Enterprises. And we're talking about GPO relationships today, Hayes. And I think... You know, I stole your question. I I saw your face. You know, we have a video in the background while we record these and was asking about what is the impact of all of that consolidation on the vendors. But I think the other thing that really stood out to me was just a conversation about the adjusting strategy that GPOs are taking and especially that focus on purchase services. I've seen that 
up front and center as I had been a vendor for a service organization. And every time I ran into supply chain, you could just tell, or materials management, whoever was doing the contracting with me, you could just tell how difficult their job was to take one service, compare it to another, and really determine where the value point was. So getting some help with that and and having some strategies from the GPOs, I think, is is really critical and no surprise why they moved into that space. But, Hayes, I got to say, I'm I'm sorry for stealing your question, man. Well, I will definitely hold it against you. It uh, it hurt my heart uh, that you did that. But Jeff actually hit it out of the park. He uh, clearly, with his background of working at the, the various different GPOs, he has great insight. Some of the things he touched on about executive buy-in, clinical buy-in, all those were really pertinent points. And obviously, more important now than, than before. Again, I will hold that against you, Justin. <laughs> All right. Well, that's going to do it for this week's show. As a reminder, you can help support Power Supply by subscribing on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast application. We'd certainly appreciate a rating and review because your feedback is important to the show. And on behalf of Hayes, Gary, and myself, thank you for listening to this week's episode of Power Supply. Power Supply.